Amen. You may be seated. Uh, AV team back there, my thing isn't working, so you're going to have to listen for me and then we'll click over together. Uh, let's begin as we've done each of uh, the weeks in this Dare to Dream series by reading the dream out loud. So um, let's read this together and then we'll begin. We dream that KCPCH and therefore RK will be a haven for those who are lost, hurting, and broken, that they may find sanctuary in the triune God. Amen. Uh, now, this fifth dream of all the dreams that we've discussed so far, if I can be honest for a second, uh, has sat the most heavy with me this week as I've prepared it. Uh, and it's not because this one is more important than the others, no. All the dreams are very important. I hope that we're praying and processing through them as fervently as the others each week. But I think this one has sat the most heavy with me because it feels the most urgent. It feels the most real, like it's the most present, the most right now, here and now. It feels like the dream that we need most to be true here and now. It's because this is a prayer and, and the dream that I can't stop praying, because it's so in front of my mind, so heavy on my heart as I pray for many of us who are indeed broken, lost, and hurting in ways that just breaks the heart. And so I'm praying that we would indeed, as a church, be a haven for those who are hurting, broken, and lost, and that most important, that God would be their sanctuary, their place of rest. And if you've been a member with us for a while and, and you're involved in the community and the small groups, then I think you know exactly what this is like, because as you do life with people, it's inevitable that indeed you will find that many people are indeed hurting, broken, and lost. And so... I, I, I invite you to pray this with me, because in truth, is there ever really a time where this isn't true of our lives and the people that we know that indeed, that our lives are in many ways so broken, hurting, and lost? And so before we begin, I think it's appropriate that we take a moment to pray just to open our hearts up the most and open our hearts and say, God, would you help us to receive this prayer, receive this dream and be in a posture where this would become a reality. Um, AB team back there, our helpers, if you could get some chairs, there's some folks who are needing chairs back there. If you could do that, that'd be great. Um, some folks are uh, coming in a little later and uh, they would need chairs. So let's pray together uh, and then just ask, God, would you allow this word, as even as I listen, be a prayer for us so that indeed this would become a reality for us. So let's take a moment to pray together, and then I will say amen at the end, and we'll jump right in. So let's pray together, shall we? Amen. Uh, let's read together the text for today, Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 through 30. Matthew 11, 25 through 30. It'll be on the screen, uh, and I invite you to read along with us, and then we'll jump right in uh, to our game plan for the day. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 through 30. As usual, I invite you to read aloud with me. Let's read God's word together. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Click over. Uh, the game plan for the day is pretty simple. Who is Jesus talking to? What is this rest that he's offering? Why should we desire this rest that Jesus is offering? And how do we get this rest that Jesus is offering? Who, what, why, how? Pretty simple. Click. Uh, let's go right into it. Who is Jesus speaking to? I think when you read this initially, um, it might seem like Jesus is only speaking to those who in this very moment are weary and heavy laden. And if that were the case, it's a very specific group of people because to be weary in the Greek here is someone who is so weary that they're about to give up. That's a pretty low place. And to be heavy laden is to be burdened, like this in, this, uh, in the picture you see, click, like an animal that is carrying people's luggage loaded up with a burden. That's what it means to be heavy laden. 
Okay, so if you are so weary that you're about to give up and you're carrying this type of weight as this animal is doing for other people for a long time, then that is what it means to be weary and heavy laden. Click. And so although life isn't easy a lot of the times, I think it would seem that Jesus might be speaking not to the majority but to the minority, those who are right now weary and heavy laden, those who are particularly in this moment going through a very difficult season of life. As in there's normal life difficulty, right? Kind of normal life difficulty. And then there's weary and heavy laden life difficulty, or if it's lower for you, depending on how you do the scale. And if you've ever walked with someone who's going through one of these seasons, I think you'll notice the difference between kind of normal and quote unquote weary and heavy laden difficulty. But I think to read this scripture this way, as if it applies only to those in a particularly heavy season, is to be reading it incorrectly because, in my opinion, click, I think everyone, right, Jesus is speaking to every single one of us. Or better, to Jesus, every single one of us is weary and heavy laden and therefore in need of rest for our souls. Now, here's why I think this. Uh, I don't know if you remember from a few weeks ago, we talked about missions during a sermon. Uh, and, we, and we mentioned how in the beginning of uh, Matthew, chapters 4 through 9, Jesus is on this frenzied activity of going around, healing people, uh, and doing all these things. If you remember, click. Remember the slide from a couple weeks ago, right? And he was going around and around. He was doing all these things. And it was almost as if he was just kind of restlessly going around and doing all these things, healing demons, uh, casting them out, so on and so forth. Click. And then after he was done, we're told that Matthew, right? We're told by Matthew that Jesus then goes around from city to city. And that what he saw, right? Everywhere he looked, he saw people who were distressed and thrown down like sheep without a shepherd, which is what then caused him to say the harvest is plenty and yet the workers are few. Then in chapter 10, Jesus points disciples to be the workers of that harvest and then tells them what discipleship is going to look like. And then in 11, Jesus gives us the reason why he's offering rest to us in the first place. That everyone, including John the Baptist, more on him later, though everyone had seen Jesus do all these miracles all over the place, they were still not repenting and turning to Jesus. People were seeing, but they had no idea what they were seeing. And so then Jesus says, Woe to all of these cities who have been seeing everything that I've been doing and yet not recognizing and not returning or repenting and turning to me. So then Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who I've seen, all of you who are heavy thrown down, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest because all of you need it because all of you are without sheep or sheep without a shepherd. Now, you might say to me at this point, well, Pastor Pete, being honest, I'm not trying to say that my life is perfect right now, but life is good. I do not feel in this very moment weary nor burdened. So are you sure Jesus is trying to speak to me? Because it doesn't sound like it. Well, let me explain this way. Uh, if you haven't seen the Broadway musical Hamilton, I highly recommend to you. Um, it's on Disney+, Plus, so if you subscribe to that, all the parents in here probably do, uh, go watch it. It's really great. Uh, but Little Ones, it's got some cursing in it, so maybe not. But anyways, I recommend it to you. But one of my favorite songs of the musical is Satisfied, which is this scene here, which is very ironic, because the song is all about how the main singer, Angelica Schuyler there, right, and Hamilton, sing about how they are never satisfied. Hamilton in the song says, there's a million things that I haven't done, just you wait, just you wait. Now, Angelica sings this song because she finds herself in a very interesting life predicament. Okay, she's at a party with her two younger sisters. And these sisters are important because one, their father is maybe the most wealthiest person in the land. And secondly, they're all apparently very beautiful and very single. And so the oldest, right, spots Alexander Hamilton and immediately she's smitten. She's going, ooh, that boy handsome. He's strong, he's bold, he's smart. I gotta have me some of him. And then as she's going through these feelings, apparently from the other side of the room, she sees her sister and her sister's got the same look and she's smitten by Alexander Hamilton all at the same time. So in that moment, she's got to make a decision. What do I do? And she makes this very interesting and bold decision. Even though she's in love with Hamilton and wants him for herself, she knows how devastated her younger sister will be knowing her character. And she also knows that as the oldest daughter of a very wealthy man who has no sons, it is her duty and job almost to marry a wealthy person. And Alexander Hamilton is dirt poor. So she's like, though I don't want to, I'm going to introduce him to my younger sister, knowing that they'll get married. And then what she says is at least this way, I can keep him in my life because she's married to my sister. But then she also sings that even though she understands why she did everything, that she will indeed never be satisfied because Alexander Hamilton, the love of her eye, she does not have her, him as her own. 
the song essentially describes this idea that's been around forever, that in life, we will never truly be happy or find true satisfaction and happiness, no matter how hard we try. It's an idea, right, that philosophers and psychologists and theologians all have observed and understood, including click Bruce Lee, the greatest philosopher of all. Be happy, but never satisfied. Point is, it's not just a Christian idea. Click. You see, one of life's greatest tricks, if we're going to call it that, is getting human beings to think. Okay, and again, hear me out. The greatest trick, one of the greatest tricks of life is getting us human beings to think that if I could just have that one thing, that one person, that one job, or that one success, or that one whatever, fill in the blank, then getting that thing will fulfill us and make us happy and satisfy us. And for each person, that one whatever is different, isn't it? And as time goes, that one thing changes, which means it's not even the one thing in the first place. Only then for us to realize that in the end, perhaps after getting that one thing we've wanted for so long, that it's actually not enough. Why? Because there's always more, better, greater, or whatever-er you want to add. And to be clear, this is not just describing people with oversized greed. It's actually particularly heavy in people who feel like this. Click, I'm never quite good enough, ever. That no matter how hard I try, it's never good enough. Compared to others, I'm always just a bit short. I can't live up to what my parents want, what my boss wants, what my culture wants, and perhaps most, what I want. And then in the social media world that we live in, this never enough, goodness, it's, it's never been like this, ever. Because what is good enough or what is better has never been so prevalent and available to people like it is today. All of us have access to people's greater, more, and bigger, and er. See, like when I was younger, the only people that I knew was the TV and then people actually living around me, right? And so the people on the TV are celebs, and so I'd be like, you know what, my life's never going to be like that. That's kind of crazy. So I'll just let them be and be their celebrity selves and whatever. They got a whole life on their own. But I would compare myself to people around me. And that group, you know, there's a little bit of variance, but there's not a lot. But nowadays... I mean, you hear about the random mom who sings a song in a car and then her video goes viral and she's on Ellen. Like, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. All these things that you see, we can have more. So the more or the never enough is limitless now. And so this burden, this weariness, this voice that you cannot shut off in your mind and your heart that says we are never enough is the restlessness we feel. It's the inner murmur, as someone calls it, the nagging voice and the feeling that you just can't get rid of restlessness, weariness, burden, that no matter what happens, that never seems to go away. This is the everyone, and this is the weary and the heavy laden that Jesus is speaking to all of us about. And we have to be honest whether indeed this is true for us. Then second, what is Jesus offering? Click one more. Come to me and I will give you rest, he says in verse 29, rest for your souls. So clearly this isn't just a physical rest, which is important. Physical rest is quite important, but it's more than that. Because no matter how much rest you get physically, if your mind, heart, and soul are restless, well, the physical rest just doesn't do anything, does it? Have you ever had one of those nights where you slept, but you woke up and you were feeling restless and you felt like you didn't sleep at all? That's what that means, right? And so Jesus is offering not just physical rest, but more the quieting, the stilling, the freedom from that inner voice and feeling, the murmur, the restlessness that constantly tells us we're not enough, we need more, there's something better, and we got to get it. It's what the psalmist describes as being still or ceasing to strive and knowing that Yahweh is God. Jesus is offering this true rest, true peace, and true freedom. Now, this sounds great, I'm sure, to many of you, but this is when Christianity gets real, isn't it? As in, we've all heard that Jesus gives us rest, cool. We've all heard that we should be still and cease striving, and God is God, cool. But at this point is when we go, I have no idea what that means, and what that looks like, and how to get it. And so it causes us to dig into the scripture a little bit more, and when we dig in a bit more as to what this rest is, is when we realize that things get way sticky. Because the rest that Jesus is offering, if I may be honest, is something that I think most people would flat out quickly reject and say, no, thank you. Now, if you notice from the text, Jesus does not offer some multiple-step plan to find rest. There's no roadmap, do this, step-by-step guide. There's no GPS here. Unlike many other religions that offers some sort of process, a road to this freedom and peace and rest, all Jesus seems to offer is himself. 
click. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble and you will find in me rest for your souls. And then you look a little deeper and then you realize that the statement is take my yoke and learn from me. And in this statement, you realize that what Jesus is offering isn't just himself. No, he's offering a very specific relationship with himself. A relationship that as you come to understand more of it, might seem ludicrous and insane, which is why most would reject it, at least at first. Here's what Jesus is offering. He is offering discipleship to those who are weary and heavy laden, which is to say, Jesus is offering that he become our master and we become his disciple, apprentice, and servant. Let me say that again. In discipleship, Jesus is offering that he becomes our master and that we become his disciple, apprentice, and servant. Now, for a hot second, think about how that sounds to you. And for the ones in here who are very successful and do not have a boss, think about what that sounds like to you. It's why Jesus says, take my yoke, because a yoke makes absolutely clear what Jesus is getting at. Click. A yoke is this thing. It's the wooden thing that's around these animals' necks. You put it around the neck of an ox or a mule, right? And attached to the yoke, then, is a machine, a plow, some sort of a thing that does the work that a farmer wants to do. And then the master is in the back, usually, steering and guiding all this to happen, and the animals are getting the work done. So click. To take a yoke, then, is to become the animal that does the work that the master wants to do all the while he's instructing, guiding, and ordering you around. Now, the reason why this example is appropriate is because discipleship in those days actually worked like this. If you ever wanted to learn a skill and become something, you would then find a person who knows that skill or trade. And unlike today, where you go and you hire that person out and they get, come to your house or you go to their house and they give you a lesson and then you go away, this is not how it worked. What you would do is you would ask that person and then they would say, okay, I'll take you on to be my disciple. Then you would go to that person's house, live with that person, eat with that person, live with that, to do everything from that person. And more importantly, you do what they tell you to do. His or her agenda is now your agenda. And so again, today you would pay somebody to give you lessons and you learn in those days, you exchange your servanthood for the master's skill. That's the payment. And so not only did you learn the skill, but more so than that, you served the master's interest by doing everything and anything the master wanted you to do. So to become then someone's disciple in those days and in this context what Jesus is offering is to relinquish and give up your right to self-determination. I just offended like 80% of the world where you no longer have the right to decide what you want and who you want to be. Because from the moment you say yes, your master now has all the control and the power, and you do as he or she says. Again, in exchange for your services, he or she teaches you their skill, and you cannot get that skill from anyone else, nor in any other way. Timothy Keller, the famous pastor, says, Discipleship in those days is giving your master the right to dominate your life. Do you see why this offer then would sound insane as a way to properly finding freedom, peace, and rest from our weary and heavy-laden souls? Because the world will tell you that no matter what you do, right, everyone, students, young people, everyone, the world tells you no matter what you do, never ever let anyone give up this freedom. Don't ever let anyone take your freedom, your right to self-realize, self-determine, right, and make something of yourself because that freedom is what gives us joy and satisfaction and the ability to find myself and find what makes me happy. And they, they would ask, then how are you supposed to do any of that if you don't have that control and the ability to decide? And yet here's Jesus offering the very opposite. The only way you will find true rest, freedom, and peace is to give all that up, give it to me, Jesus, and in me find that freedom and peace. Me as your master and you as my disciple. Let that sink in for a second. So then now that you know what he's offering, let's then discuss why we should desire this. You may have noticed something as you read the passage. Did you notice there's a lot of me, my's, and I's in the passage? You can click. Come to me, 
take my yoke, learn from me, I am gentle and humble, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Me, mys, and eyes, all over the place. Now, I think when most people read this section, I think the thing that sticks out to them, click, is these words, yoke, rest, and burden, right? Come to me and take my yoke, and I will give you rest. I think we find ourselves emphasizing the yoke and trying to figure out why a yoke would be restful in the first place. But if you place the emphasis on what Jesus does, click again, on the me's, the my's, and the eyes, it reads very differently. Again, hear it this way. Come to me, take my yoke, learn from me, I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice it isn't come to me and take this yoke, learn from it, and it will give you rest. No. It's me, my yoke, and I. Now what Jesus is saying is fairly simple, but really significant. What he's trying to tell us is this. There are a lot of yokes in the world, and then there's mine. Okay? Millions of yokes all over the world, and then there's mine. And so the offer that Jesus is giving to us for him to be our master and us his disciple isn't us going from freedom, no master, I have all the control and the ability to do whatever I want, and then all of a sudden becoming Jesus' disciple where he has all the control. That's not the offer. It isn't going from freedom and then taking on Jesus' yoke and then tying ourselves down and becoming his disciple. Kind of sounds like what a lot of people describe, or especially men describe like marriage to be like. I get that all the time. Oh, you got married? Why'd you get married so young? You lose all your freedom. That's not the way this works. That's not the offer. The offer is, no, 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 you are already burdened and yoked to something or someone else, and now you're taking that off and you're putting on Jesus' yoke. It isn't, I have all the control over my life, now all of a sudden I got to give it up. No, what the truth he's trying to say is this, click, everyone, no matter who you are, is yoked to something and or someone, always. We are always burdened by something or someone. Facts. Now, you might have heard me say that every human being was created to worship, that just as dogs bark and cats meow, humans worship. It's why many of us are just obsessed with superheroes. You have been since you were a little kid, you still are, whether you're 40 or not, just be honest, right? It's why we're obsessed with knight and shining armor rescue stories. And what we realize is that because we are worshiping people, Simply, there's never a time where we're not worshiping someone or something. That there's never a time in our lives where we're not burdened or yoked to something. If you've attended a church long enough, you've most likely heard a pastor ask the people, what is it that you are living for, right? Simple question, but really profound. What are you living for? And of course, the answer to this can be many things, right? For young people, it may be the approval of your parents, as you get a little older, maybe you might be finding that special someone or maybe becoming successful and making something of yourself. And for parents, maybe it's living for our children, making sure that they turn out the way we want them to, so on and so forth. But the reason why you may have been asked to confront that which you're living for is because however it is that you answer, whatever it is that we're living for, and by the way, today it seems like you can live for multiple things, whereas in the past you really only live for one thing usually, or simpler back then. Now it's like you can live for 18 bajillion things, which makes things even more complicated, but Whatever you are living for, that is your master. That is what controls what you do, and that is what burdens you into the never satisfied, never enough, always more, better, bigger, and more -er life that we tend to live. And again, I remind you, that master can be me. Let me give you a couple examples. Students in here, tell me, if you live for your parents, how easy is that life? Uh, you can click. This is Stephen Hayes' uh, Asian grading scale. A is average, B is below average, C is can't eat dinner, D is don't come home, and F is find a new family. Jokes, but the reason why all the students are laughing is they're, they're laughing and crying at the same time. They're just not showing it. You can click out. It's disturbing if you look at that too long. <laughs> Jokes aside, the point is, it's not easy living for our parents. The number of times I still heard a student tell me, I wish my parents would just love me, but I don't ever seem to be good enough for them. Or those of us that are married in a serious relationship, how is it easy? Is it easy to live 
to make the other one happy, that that's your main goal in life? It's not easy. Actually, it's not even possible. And if that's the case, then what ends up happening in these relationships usually is that, one, you can never make that other person happy, but secondly, you can't be real because you're afraid that the other person might not be happy with your real. And then if the other person criticizes you, well, then that just crushes your soul because all you ever want to do is make that other person happy and then forget criticizing the other and trying to help that person out because they're not going to like being criticized. Who likes being criticized? So that doesn't work. Or parents who live for our children. Let's be honest. We do, don't we? Ask yourself, parents in the room, when have our children ever been what we want them to be? Don't we just wish they'd be just a little bit more? And I get it. We believe in them. We think they're great. We think they have all the talent in the world. But still, what if they don't? Then either they never discover who they are because they don't ever risk being who they are because they're afraid of disappointing you or you dominate their life, maybe in a good way, as you do everything for them that they never have any other reason to be anything more than what they are, which is just spoiled most of the time. Or as Christians, the need to be the perfect Christian, how heavy is that on people? We could go on forever, it seems. But the point is this. There are a million yokes, things that we're burdened by, the unrelenting restlessness they induce in us in a forever weariness. And perhaps we can handle it most of the time and do a good job of hiding it. But then there are times when it just becomes too much and the burdens we've already been carrying overwhelms and then it's too late. And this is when then we need to realize how different than Jesus' yoke is. Because again, don't get it twisted. He's offering a yoke. He's not offering a non-yoked life. He's offering his yoke. We've got to realize that why is the rest that we find in him come from being his disciple and him our master? Why is that the only true rest that will give us peace and freedom? Well, the answer is going back to looking at Jesus' yoke, the thing that he invites us to take us. Click. This is again a yoke, Okay. Reminder, you place it around the neck of the animal and then you attach the yoke to the plow or whatever machine and then the master steers and then they do the work, okay? And so, just, just straight up, if Jesus is offering a yoke, he's offering that you become like the animal. Don't get it twisted now. And he then becomes our master. But this is when things get really great because Jesus is not your average normal master, is he? You see, in those days, actually, certain masters and farmers one day realized, wait a minute, there might be a better way to utilize our animals to do the work than we would be doing. Because normally you would do it like, just like this picture. You place two very equal, strong, and capable animals in the yoke, and then they pull and they do their work, and it's great. Proficiency, effectiveness, all that stuff. Efficient work. But what this, hap what this does after a while is that while you would get great work in the moment, it's actually very fragile. Because if anything happens to one of your animals, well, now you're one animal down. And then all you got is animals that aren't ready because they just are sitting there waiting to grow. And so they realized, wait, wait, there might be a better system. So what they started to do on purpose was to take one very strong, capable animal and then paired it on purpose with a younger, not so capable animal. And so essentially the older capable one or stronger capable one is doing all the work. But what ended up happening in the long run, they realized was, wait, the younger one learns a lot faster than we ever give them credit for. And if that happens, well, then you have a lot more capable animals to do the work. And then even better, right, since you have more animals, animals are fresh because you can rest them rather than just working the same two animals over and over and over again. So like, oh, this is brilliant. So they started doing this thing. And this is actually what Jesus is talking about. The reason why I tell you this isn't, isn't to give you some agricultural lesson, even though I just did. The point is this. When Jesus says, take my yoke, you can click. And he says the burden is easy and light. What he's telling you is, I'm not asking you to take a yoke and then I'm not even telling you that I, like these very brilliant masters, are going to pair you up with someone great. That's not what I'm saying. No, 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 no. He's saying, I'm a master unlike anyone that you've seen. The reason why my yoke is easy is because I am gentle and humble. So humble that I am not your master from the back uh, organizing the animals. I am the master who gets in the yoke with you. I come down to earth and go where you are, take on your flesh that's bleedable, cuttable, and dieable, become one of you, and I will do everything that you aren't able to do. I will live the life, sinless life you can't live, and die the death that you can't survive, and then I will rise so that you will rise with me. 
and the yoke I'm inviting you to take, I'm already wearing it. It's not him presenting the yoke to you and saying, will you take this? It's him in the yoke and saying, will you fill this empty spot next to me? Because in doing so, you will learn from me. I am gentle and humble, you will learn, and you will learn in gentle and humble ways. And my yoke is so different. It's light and easy, where every other yoke is weary and heavy. Why? Because I carry this yoke for you. All you have to do is take it and follow me. Won't you let me be your master? Because when you do, you will find rest. So then lastly, how do we get this rest? How do we take this yoke? What does that even mean? We mentioned earlier, I said, we're going to talk about John the Baptist in a second. Well, as Jesus was going around healing, people, including John the Baptist, were like, yo, what is he? They weren't recognizing. John the Baptist went as far as being like, are you sure you're the Messiah? (laughs) So then in verse 25, this is what Jesus says. You can click over. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Everything that Jesus had been doing, God the Father had purposely hidden from the wise and the intelligent. And take a look around. Everyone in this room is amongst the wise and the intelligent. Good for you. Good for us. But he hid them from them and only revealed them to infants. We got a couple of infants in the room. And it says God was pleased with this. Why? Because it shows just how we will allow Jesus to be our master and then in him find rest. Jesus has often said to the Gospels that if people want to enter the kingdom of God, they have to become like what? Children. Hmm. One of the fundamental ways of becoming a Christian is to be childlike. Huh. One of the ways that we then know that we are Christian is to be childlike. Just process this for a second. Okay? No one likes to be called childlike. No one likes to be called children. But that's what Jesus says. But notice that he's not saying we should be exactly like children or childish. That's different. Because not everything about children are good. Sorry to break it to you, children. Not everything about you are good. But Jesus is telling us then that we have to be like children in two very specific ways. And if we have young ones, you'll know exactly what this is like. First, he tells us infants, little ones, are helpless and they know it. We love our infants, don't we? One of their great qualities is whenever they need something, they will tell you by whining, moaning, crying, and yelling. And they will cry as long and loud as they want until they get what they want. And they are not ashamed or embarrassed that the entire world knows it. They have no qualms about being helpless and needing people to give them what they want. They don't care as long as they get what they want. Even their language. In the beginning, they learned sign language, right? So cute. I call it the monkey face or the zoo animal face. Every time they learn a thing, everyone comes by and be like, hey, do this again. More, choose tail, eat. eat." So we, and they do. But even the things that they are taught to do is I am helpless. I need you to give me more because I can't get it myself. Hmm. Their every word is help me, hold me, give me, feed me more. And the one every parent loves to hate, up. Pick me up. It's how it is with them, isn't it? All the parents are crying and laughing all at the same time. But what happens when these little infants, they grow up a little bit and they feel like, you know what? I'm a little something. I got, I I learned something. I'm a little wise and I'm a learned and I'm capable. So you offer them something where they say, no, I can do it all by myself. If If your children haven't gotten to that, prepare yourself. You're going to hear it every single day. Helplessness, and in an instant, literally becomes determination to do it by themselves. And this is what we're like with God. We think we can do it on our own. And we would rather that we do it on our own. I don't need your help. But let's just be really honest. Okay? Seasoned Christians in the room. The difficult, complicated, involved, even important decisions you make in your life What's the first thing you do if you don't already know what to do? You do pray or do you go to Google? Do you call a friend or do you pray to God? Which lifeline, in the words of who wants to be a millionaire, are you calling? The one who has all the answers 
the one who created you, or the all-knowing, all-seeing Google? Jokes aside, let's be really honest for a second, no? And so what Jesus is telling us is that the only way we will truly receive rest and freedom and peace from that relentless restlessness is to realize and unashamedly cry that I am helpless. Lord, hold me, give me, feed me. I cannot save myself. I cannot win on my own. And apart from you, as it says in John, I am nothing. But when is the last time you said those words? We sing, hold me close. Give me faith. Feed me your word. Our hearts cry, ought be, I know I cannot, and I'm not ashamed to say, I need you. But it's the first thing we lose. And the second thing, children trust that they are loved. Oh, we love our children. Let's be honest, parents, for a second. If your parents are in the room, earmuffs, just kidding. We don't always like our children all the time, do we? Let's be real. We love them, but we don't always like them, right? I don't like you very much right now, we want to say to them, although it's mean. Why? Because children are difficult, a lot, most, maybe all the time. But have you noticed? When they're really young, no matter what it is they've done, they have zero doubts that you, mom or dad, love them. They go into the bathroom and drink the toilet water. They go into the pantry and pour out the rice all over the place. They take the toothpaste and smear it all over the carpet. My youngest one did that. And even after they do it, they'll come to you and say, hold me. Give me, feed me. Up. Stupid up. Just up all the time. It's as if they've lost or do not have the ability to think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I do this one thing, my parents are going to be so mad that they won't love me and hold me anymore. It's the inner murmur of most students who are trying to live for their parents. They think, if I don't do well on this thing, my parents are going to hate me. They don't have that ability. In many ways, little children, it's like they pompously, brashly like tell you, I know you love me, bro. I know you love me. Don't deny it. I know you do. And when I throw a tantrum and you don't like me, you're still going to hold me when I ask you to. Why? Because you love me. But how many of us, now that we're grown, wise and intelligent and capable, feel this way about anyone? About our God? And of course, the wise and people, intelligent people will say, well, well, duh, how could you expect anyone to love you no matter what you do? Well, that's the point. Grown and wise people don't, can't expect it, but little ones, they can, because they know that's how they were made. Why can we trust it? Because God tells us so. Why? Because the cross tells us so. Why? Because he says his love is actually unconditional, without conditions, forever, no matter what. But though we hear it, we, unlike children, do not trust it. And therefore, we cannot find rest in him, nor become his disciple, and live the way we're meant to live. live. Now, at this point, you might be like, okay, Pastor Pete, let me just be real with you for a second. All this sounds great, but honestly, the thing that's getting to me is I'm just afraid. I'm afraid that if I let anyone be my master, anyone dominate my life, take full responsibility and control over my life, in the end, I'm going to be overrun, oppressed, and exploited. It happens every time. Maybe, Pastor Pete, I can admit that I'm truly helpless. Okay, cool. But to trust that God loves me and will not abandon me, that his love is true always and forever, I can't. I just can't. So what am I supposed to do? Well, this is then when I'll invite you one last time to fix your gaze upon Jesus' yoke, the true yoke, if you click. We mentioned John the Baptist, let me mention him one last time. When he saw what Jesus was doing, he questioned if Jesus was a true Messiah. Why? Because he said, well, I know what the Messiah is supposed to be like. The Messiah is supposed to come in power and overthrow everyone else and bring victory to Israel. How is Israel going to be the nation if you don't come in power? 
But here you are, Jesus, always hanging out with widows, poor people, the lonely, the hurting, and healing and loving them. You ain't doing anything to show your power. So Jesus, John is asking, when are you going to show your power? Are you ever, wait, are you sure, are we sure that you're actually the powerful Messiah? And Jesus' response is to take the yoke. Because in doing so, he's saying, I didn't come in strength to judge evil. I came in weakness to die for evil. Theologians have agreed forever. If you actually want Jesus to judge all the evil in the world, well, that would be the end of all of us. No more evil to judge. But what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 I didn't come to destroy the yokes that you're wearing. No, I came to bear the yoke that you're wearing. I came to go to the cross to bear the yoke of all yokes, the burden of all burdens, the one you cannot bear and survive. Because in truth, we are actually never good enough for God. Our sin, the moment it enters, is never good enough for Him. And He's saying, I came to bear that yoke so that you can live. And then He goes one step further. See, I think oftentimes we might think that the striking thing about Jesus is that He died. And that's strange. But there's actually something stranger It's not that he died, but it's the way that he died. If you read about martyrs in scripture and also in history, they're very brave. They die praying and singing glory to God. And you're like, oh, I just want to be like that, right? I I want to have that faith. I want to be like on fire. So even when I'm dying and people are stoning me, I want to be able to be like, you know, glory to God. But that's not actually how Jesus died. Did you notice? When he dies, he's torn up. He's anxious. He's restless. He's bleeding sweat. He's crying out. He's anguishing, asking God if he could get out of this mess. So you go, wait, why? Because in taking on the great yoke, Jesus then takes on our restlessness that comes with it. To give us true freedom and peace, he has to endure the relentless and ever, ever, forever going restlessness. And he defeats that as well. Because that's the only way he can give us rest, is to eliminate the restlessness of our lives on the cross. And that's why taking on the yoke is easy and light. Because he does it for us. So finding rest is to admit that we're helpless. And then praying that the Spirit will allow us to trust in His love. That God knows best and He's indeed done all the work that we will no longer have to restlessly worry about enough, more, better, anything. Because we have it all. But only if you take the yoke. Now as we finish, two things I must say, and we'll invite the praise team up. We cannot get lost in the love that Jesus gives on the cross and forget that the invitation is to be a disciple. Take the yoke. It means his way is our way. It means be committed to a community and his ways. Live as he tells you to live. It means be a disciple. Pray. Read his scripture. Worship. All the things that we've been dreaming, that's what it means to be a disciple. So I cannot emphasize that enough. But secondly, for those in here who are particularly going through the dark night of the soul, as they sometimes say, those who are going through just unimaginable difficulties, some who are going through such difficulty that they can't physically be here because it's too difficult for them, for those of you, I want to say this. Taking the yoke is the answer for rest. And you might wonder, wait, how? And it's because what Jesus does is he takes the yoke upon himself and then he goes to the cross and then he defeats the greatest yoke. Then he keeps the yoke on and then he says, won't you come next to me and take this? And which means that every difficulty you go through, he's right there beside you. It's why he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The world is a difficult place to live in. I can't get rid of all of your pains and troubles. That's never the promise. But the promise is, I will be with you always, and I will do the work. So church, will you then find rest in him? Admit that you're helpless. Trust that he loves you. Take on his yoke of discipleship. And then say, Jesus, I follow you. Take me for the ride. 
Help me to learn from you, for your yoke is easy and light. And give me rest in you. And so before the worship team leads us in song, may I invite you to pray. What are you living for? What is the yoke 